for that very flattering introduction um, and for this opportuni opportunity to tell you a little bit about my work in Uganda. Um, we're really at an exciting point in the HIV epidemic as far as we at least hope that the end is in sight with goals to end the epidemic by 2030. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in Uganda for the past 10 years and I'll talk a little bit about some of that work today. We've made dramatic uh, progress as far as um, reducing deaths from AIDS as well as reducing the number of people who are infected with HIV um, annually. However, um, let me see, there we go. Um, if you notice that in 2015, over 2 million people globally were newly infected with HIV. So clearly we have some work to do yet. As far as if we think about, well, how can we address the HIV epidemic from a public health perspective? Um, we have both behavioral and biomedical approaches. And on the surface, it seems simple. We just need to prevent people who are uninfected from becoming infected, and we need to prevent people who are infected from infecting other people. But it's not so simple. Um, a lot of the work I've been involved in has been centered around behavioral um, interventions to reduce people's risk for either acquiring HIV or transmitting HIV. Um, in this particular study, we tested an intervention um, to look at if we could reduce um, people's risk behavior after they received HIV testing in um, a primary healthcare clinic, which was a routine HIV testing. And what we saw was that people at our intervention decreased their um, sexual risk behavior over time, whereas people in the control um, did so, but to a lesser extent. But as we focused more on really a fighting the HIV epidemic and trying to end it, um, we have to focus on really reaching the people at greatest risk for HIV. Um, a few years ago, the United Nations Agency for um, AIDS came out with what they call their 90-90-90 targets. And what this refers to is that we, um, we want to get 90% of people who are living with HIV to know that they're infected. We want 90% of those um, to be receiving antiretroviral treatment, and we want 90% of those to be virally suppressed, meaning that they have virtually um, no chance of transmitting the virus to other people. And on a population level, that comes out to 90%, 81%, and 73%. And when I think about this, really the key is this part. It's the getting people who know or who are infected to know that they are infected. And so the question is, how do we reach those people? So one approach that we've worked on is home-based HIV testing. And this is literally where people go door to door and offer everyone HIV testing. Um, and we have found that, probably counterintuitively, that it's actually um, very cost effective to do this. Um, we tend to reach more people, such, or harder to reach groups such as men and couples, um, that are harder to reach with traditional health facility based approaches. And we reach people earlier um, as far as from when they've been infected. Um, however, we don't know very much about um, what happens after these people are tested in home-based testing? Are they able to access um, health care? Are they able to get on treatment? And are they able to become virally suppressed? So the study that we're conducting currently um, is called the um, Providing Access to Health Care, or the PATH study, or in the local language of Luganda, the Ikubo study. It's a cluster randomized intervention tri trial where we're randomizing villages to the intervention, which consists of follow-up home visits and linkage to social support, to a control condition, which is usual care, which is basically a referral to health care. Um, over the course of the study, we will test around 20,000 people. We'll enroll 600 in our intervention trial, and those are people who are newly diagnosed. And then we'll also follow another 750 who were aware of being HIV infected to monitor their viral load. So we're focusing on looking at um, can we see higher rates of viral, viral suppression in our intervention villages compared to control? And then um, intermediate outcomes of obviously are people able to access health care and are they getting on treatment? We're also doing a cost effectiveness analysis, uh, analysis of the intervention. Um, so, so far in January, we have reached 5,400 people. We had 3.7% people decline um, to be 
enrolled in the study, and 4.7% tested HIV positive. So far, what we've seen in our data really kind of underscores the importance of having population level data to identify gaps as we really work to end the HIV epidemic. Um, so where we're working is kind of central southern Uganda. It's a predominantly rural area, so no large towns or cities. So what we're looking at right now is comparing our data to national data on the progress on these 90-90-90 targets. And what we're seeing so far um, is that as far as the percentage of people that um, are living with HIV who know their status, we're only finding about 36% of people um, in that category, whereas the national estimates are around 69%. Um, so clearly there's a big gap there, and there's also the gap in reaching that 90 target. Um, now you may ask, well, what about those people who decline to be tested? Um, so let's say that we figure half of those people are positive, and that's why they decline to be in our study. Um, we're still below this 69% national coverage of um, HIV testing, really showing that um, there may be some sort of rural disparities in access to HIV testing with current approaches. And then, obviously, consequently, we see fairly low performance on these other targets um, and also still below the, the national estimates. And to our knowledge, um, our study is the only study or program collecting any kind of data at the population level on um, the percentage of people who are aware of their status, whereas the national data is best based upon estimates from um, the Ministry of Health. Okay. Um, also very concerning in our data, we've seen that only 22% of people who were undiagnosed with HIV had actually never tested for HIV, which considering that Uganda's ep epidemic has been going on for a long time, that's fairly concerning that they haven't been reached with testing approaches. Um, so now we're really focusing on thinking about, well, how can we reach the people who are at greatest risk um, and are the, in the most need for interventions? So we currently have a couple of grants under review where we're looking at developing interventions for sex workers in brothels and fishermen in fishing villages, um, both of those focusing on people who drink alcohol. And then um, in Brazil, um, which is where I just returned from yesterday, um, we just started up a study, and this is in collaboration with Dr. Zuniga, um, where we're looking at figuring out how to develop interventions for people with comorbidities, um, including tuberculosis and substance use, and helping them um, access care and stay in care and um, avoid um, transmitting the virus to other people. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to find out, so you look, that study is looking at those who drink alcohol, is that because they're more likely to engage in risky behaviors or is there some other reason? So the, yeah, the future work, um, yeah. yes. So alcohol is definitely a risk factor for um, infection. Actually, a lot of my previous work looked at that in a very detailed way. So um, in, under certain circumstances, it's definitely a major risk factor. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. What do you make, I'm very surprised to see this statistic that you put up about 22% of, if I read it right, it's 22% mm -hmm. of newly, of people that you are determining mm -hmm. are infected had never been tested before. Yes. And this is in Uganda. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, my understanding, which this is way outside of my field, but you know, this is a huge issue for their economy. This is a huge issue for world health. This, you know, it seems like all the attention has and ought to have been put on on, on this region of, of, of this part of the world, and, and yet, uh, how, what do you make of that? I mean, is there, well, is there a, where, where is the breakdown occurring, I mean, or, is yeah. it, or is it all over the place and just? I think, I mean, Uganda has actually been kind of a model in addressing the HIV epidemic, and they've actually rolled out a number of pretty innovative um, ways to try to get people access to testing. You know, they've made it routine when whenever you go to a health facility for, a, you know, a cold, you get 
tested for HIV, they've done community outreach, they've done home-based testing to some extent, but not on a large scale. Um, you know, they try to target high-risk groups. But, you know, if someone doesn't want to be tested, they're going to sort of hide. And so it's really the question of how do we find these people who are hidden? And, you know, it may be that literally going to people's houses, we're finding more of these people who just either never wanted to get tested or never accessed healthcare for any other reason, so never had the opportunity. But it is very concerning, and I think it's kind of our, it's the barrier to progress as far as if people don't know they're infected and they can't um, sort of prevent transmitting the virus to other people. So, very interesting. Uh, I am actually more concerned about another number rather than those that don't know mm -hmm. or they don't test, mm -hmm. is 901990, the ones that are positive, mm -hmm. among those, those that know they are positive and are treated, mm -hmm. you mentioned around 40 something percent of viral load decrease rather than 90 percent. And the question is, is that an unsuccessful treatment, lack of adherence, so uh, lack of right antiviral therapy? So actually, this is on the population level. So the, the target is 73%, which basically refers to 90% of these people, 90% of those on treatment. So actually, we're seeing higher than 90% of viral suppression um, among the people who are on treatment. So really, the people who know they're positive are actually um, in tr getting treatment and are virally suppressed. And then there's a few folks who had low, low viral loads just because they haven't um, sort of been hit higher viral loads yet. Um, so I hope that clarifies, yeah. Um, this may not be part of your study, but I was wondering if you have tested for HPV also, and if you could borrow a portable HPV detector, would it be helpful? Um, well, it's, definitely, it's not part of our study, and I haven't looked at it. Um, I know HPV rates are exceptionally high. Um, and so we've done other studies where we've tested for STIs as far as looking at uh, biomarkers of risk behavior, but we haven't done that just because prevalence is so high and obviously there's no cure. Um, so we, we're not currently looking at that, but it's certainly in the context of HIV an important factor. Um, I'm not totally up on the literature as far as like, um, you know, the, the amount of risk we could reduce if we sort of address that, um, but it, I think it's certainly something to consider. Yes. Susan, in the United States, there's this big push for prophylactic, prophylactic yes. therapeutics, and there's a lot of controversy associated with that. Yes. Um, I understand that's also uh, being pushed heavily in at least parts of Africa, mm -hmm. but maybe the rural areas this is not an issue because of access, is that? Well, so um, at least in Uganda, PrEP, which is what you're referring to, um, PrEP for a long time was not supported because the government felt like, well, we, we can't even treat all the people we know are positive, so we're not gonna start giving you know, antiretrovirals to people who are just at risk. Um, but they actually recently changed and have put that in policy. I don't think they've funded it yet. Um, but there are some studies that have focused on trying to um, focus on high-risk populations like sex workers and um, fishermen and groups like that with PrEP. Um, but at the public health level, that's not being done yet. Um, I mean, I think um, the key issue with PrEP is sort of, you know, will people take it? Um, and the studies that we've, you know, that we're using as far as knowing that PrEP is effective is mostly among gay men. Um, the studies among women has shown much less effect, um, perhaps because of adherence issues and they don't think that they're at risk. And so I think it's, it kind of comes down to behavior ultimately of that, well, people have to take whatever it is and if they don't feel like they need to take it, then it's hard to take it. Did your method of reaching uh, your participants in the study yield any differences in diagnosis rates? In other words, was there any difference between uh, the villages where you did your uh, study going door to door versus 
uh, uh, doing the diagnosis when they reported for other illness issues. Was there any difference? So I would say that the, the surveillance data on like a public health level is very poor. So we can't really compare our data with anything because they, they have very regional estimates of things, but they don't have sort of even like down to district level estimates on prevalence and things like that. So unfortunately, we don't really have any data to compare our, to compare to. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.